Uh, where I'm going to begin this morning is I'm not sure. Um, I, I, I do want to give you a little bit of the overflow of some of the things that were spoken at the conference because to me they were very important principles, exhortations that were being presented. And God has assignments for you. Just this weekend, uh, I won't get into what happened with Rick this weekend, but there's powerful things that are unfolding and some who have labored uh, behind the plow in the kingdom of heaven, I do believe God's going to be releasing them into even greater levels of authority. And so we look forward to this. Part of what Chris spoke on, however, is something that we should not miss. And he talked about going to the mountain, the top of the mountain, but only three went up there. But the night prior to that, what I was speaking on is that we're, we're in defining moments. We're making choices right now that will have far-reaching impact. I used to tell my children as they were growing, there's about 10 to 25 decisions in your life that you absolutely want to get right. It's not that you can't recover from poor decisions, but if you do make some poor decisions, sometimes it takes you years to, to recover from poor decisions you make. And sometimes, in some instances, some people never recover. They get caught in an eddy spiritually, and while, they're, while their home may still eternally be in heaven, they get caught in this wash of offense and all kinds of other issues and they never fully move on to what God intended for them. The greatest tragedy that I would consider in my life, and I think you should consider it in your life, if we would miss the ultimate destiny for which God has placed us on the earth. But please listen to this because I do believe that God wants to catch our attention in this hour. And again... I have a heart for this place. I feel like in certain respects, this is a, a kind of a West Coast home for us. We feel well received. We feel um, like God has created a relationship so that when we're here, we're not breaking into your heart. It's something that has been established over a period of time. And so, to, to whatever degree we have influence, I would like to communicate this to you so that we can have God get our attention because we're in these defining moments. And so, um, Marianne, if you could come up and help uh, summarize what, we were, what you were speaking in the School of Prophets and the moment that we're in with regard to moving into the future. So as I was really praying, trying to find out what I was going to say, I reached down and pulled up a prophetic bulletin from Morningstar that was dated back to 1996 that Tom had said. And in that bulletin, it caught my attention because I had heard the Lord say to me, distractions. And I'm reading this dream that Bob Jones had. And in it, he said there were a number of us in a vehicle on a higher way, and we were stopped by an officer of the law who was looking for contraband. He found none. However, there was trash in the car, and he said, you need to get rid of this trash. As a matter of fact, we're at the dump, so you can get rid of it. And um, Bob said to, to, in the dream, he said, where we're going, we're not going to need those things anymore. We need to lighten the load. And he said, uh, Psalm 24 is a checklist for going on this higher way. And the checklist is he that has clean hands, you know, who may ascend to the hill of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood. 
So that was something that needed to be done. But Bob was saying there's plenty of distractions. The things that we had had in the past are no longer valid for where we're going. And so you need to get rid of it. You need to lighten your load. Now, the higher way speaks of Isaiah 35, which is in verse 8, it says, if I can turn there. One of the things that... Um this word that Marianne was reading to me said is that these packages that had become trash, in the past they held containers of food, and at one time they were useful, yes. but now they were no longer useful because they had served their purpose, but it was just lying around. Correct. And so Isaiah 35 verse 8 says, a highway will be there, a roadway, and it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way and fools will not wander on it. And then in uh, Hebrews 12, may I read that? Sure. Uh, in Hebrews 12, it says this, that therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance or the weight, another translation says, and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So the essentials to be on that highway of holiness was to get rid of the excess weight. And then did you want to say what the... Why don't you talk Chris? about what Chris is... Okay. Now, here's, here's, here's the progression of this. Marion is reading this to me on Monday. She, and we're discussing, as we often do, some things that we may have an opportunity to speak. We're kind of comparing notes. And I said, right from the very start, when she's reading Bob Jones's um, word to me, I'm thinking, this is the word of the Lord for the prophetic, or for the school of the prophets. And so fast forward to the next day, Tuesday, and Chris comes in my office, and I, Marianne now wants to share with Chris what she's received, just so we can have a coordination of what's going to be presented in this first meeting of the School of the Prophets. And Chris says. So I tell him what I had stumbled upon, what I felt like the Lord was leading me. And he said, this is incredible. Just last night, I had a dream that I was on Highway 35, driving an 18-wheeler, Psalm 18. And I was pulled over. I had to get to a wait station. And a patrolman said, or an, was it an angel? That was a patrolman. Okay. Said, you need to get rid of excess weight. Well, they weighed the vehicle. It's, you're too heavy. You're too you heavy. You cannot proceed until you get rid of the excess weight. And he said, um, so he did. He started unloading this huge truck, this 18-wheeler. And as he did, when he finally got to the right weight, all of a sudden, a chariot comes by. And this is the angel. With angels. And they said, get on. We're going up. And the, the chariot took him and took him way high uh, up into the heavenlies. So this is a summary. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's great. great. Um, this is a summary um, of... A progression of prophetic insight that we are receiving and part of the instruction for us is things that we have carried in the past are no longer going to be relevant as a matter of fact it may hold us back and prevent us from getting to the place where there's a higher way to do things and so we're in the process of making these choices I did not coordinate what I was going to speak with Chris on, on Friday night and on, on Saturday morning. It's a very similar message, much like Marianne had a similar message, and all of it seems to be blending together 
uh, in a cooperative fashion to send us a message. And I do believe that the appeal of God right now to the people of God, I spoke this at Morningstar, and as deeply as I can feel it, I feel that as I'm talking this, to this message, I feel like I'm talking to my son and my, my sons and my daughter. And I feel like that kind of appeal, like I don't want my kids to miss this and I don't want the people that God has given us influence to miss this opportunity. Now here's what I said the other night and I feel to say it again. Um, in in 1972, I had the opportunity to walk into the Olympic Stadium with the United States team. I was an Olympian then, and I was standing next to a guy named Bob Seagram. He, he won the pole vault in Mexico City in 1968. And as we're getting to walk out of the tunnel, he said this. He said, well... I want to tell you this, we're about to be viewed by a billion people. And he said, the uh, acclaim and the welcome that America is going to get, it was a different time then, is going to be greater than even the home teams or even Germany or East and West Germany. So he said, brace yourself. But I want to tell you this, I didn't get there without going through the Olympic trials. The Olympic trials happened in a year earlier, and in the, <clears throat> in the Olympic trials, 51 people were given invitations, but only 16 were going to meet, meet, uh, be on the team. And in a chapel that we had uh, about uh, several months ago, Morningstar, I was scheduled to speak in the chapel, and I didn't know what to say. And as I walked into the chapel meeting, I felt like I was taken back to the assembling of the groups, the group of people who, get this, had been preparing all their lives for this event, this Olympic trial. And I do believe that God is endeavoring to assemble people from various parts of nations that are gifted people, and he's inviting us to something that will, that, that will be viewed by the world. Are you tracking with me here? But only 16 out of the 51 would make the team. <clears throat> and here's, here's what happened. Shortly into this Olympic trial event, I was amazed that some people did not take this event seriously. This was an opportunity of a lifetime, and God wanted us to focus and or I, I believe from the message prophetically, God wants us to focus and embrace the opportunity of the hour. And so we're, I, I'm putting out that information so that we can be sober by the time in which we live. Now here's some things that I believe we're in being invited to. And I believe Eagle Mountain and the people that are part of this community here are part of this tribe. Here's some of the things that I believe are, we're being invited into. And this has to do with a prophetic word that I did not expect to receive almost a year ago. I walked into church much like you came in this morning. <clears throat> and I had no role in the church service that morning. I was just coming there to worship the Lord and hear what was going to be said. This was a year before we had met Chris Reed or months before we had met Chris Reed. <clears throat> and here's what I heard. I heard the roar of Niagara Falls. I, was, I went to college about 20 minutes from Niagara, had been there many times. And for some miles before you get to Niagara, you can hear the roar. And I was stunned by it, but that's not the only thing that began to um, overwhelm me. I began to recall coming close 
to the Canadian Falls. I mean, you could probably get from here to that wall. Of course, there's restraining walls, maybe even a bit closer. And you can watch the tons and tons of water pour over the falls. It still overwhelms me. The noise, the power of it all began to overwhelm me. And this is what the Lord said. The power of Niagara is coming here. And if I could create the impression that was left on my soul, I was overwhelmed. And if you've ever been to this place, this is a spectacular sight that's almost impossible to put into words until you actually witness this and the roar of it. Now, I want to draw some prophetic parallels because this is not the only time that the Lord has begun to show me different things. I do believe that <clears throat> in the early, in about 1870, 1880, there began to be on the earth creative people that had the capacity to harness the power of Niagara. And I do believe <clears throat> that this place is going to have an experience somewhat like I had where God wants to harness the power that he's about ready to release. <clears throat> 